<laughs> Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the service of worship on August 16th, 2020. It's hard to believe that summer is wending its way into fall already. And I notice there's some leaves turning there at different places, so it's going to come no matter if we're prepared or not. Um, I'm Reverend Dr. Renee Whitaker. Today joining me um, our Director of Music, Jim Hutchinson, our Christian Educator, Kristen Kane, I mean Danielle Kindig, our solo, yeah, it's not even soloist today. We have special music from Kristen Kane and Helen Kirschbaum. And so we welcome her, and we made her sit in the mulch, the most special place. And then Kevin Hall is always on uh, our camera. We looked through this week, and even though it seems like it's a quiet summer week, the deacons are meeting tomorrow evening. Our little Brown Bagum Bible group will meet on Tuesday evening at 5.30. We'll have of course, at Wednesday at noon, and um, with special words and music. And then Farmer's Market on Saturday. <clears throat> and next Sunday, Reverend Carol Isley Corey will be here. Um, I'll be in town until next weekend, but um, I won't be here next Sunday or the Sunday after. Um, also, after this week, Wednesday at Westmont's going to take a two-week hiatus. We're pretending like we're part of the big time. And um, so you'll have a chance to catch up. Um, if you didn't see Elsa's this week, it's great to see her creative spirit in action through her woodworking. And then all the other weeks going back, every week is unique and offers something of interest to people of all ages. So with those things and announcements, we gather our hearts and our minds and share in our call to worship. Give thanks to God and make God's deeds known among the people. Sing praises to God. Tell of God's marvelous works. Let our hearts and minds rejoice in the wonder of God. May we remember those witnesses of faith who have gone before us. Offer thanksgiving to God for brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us lift up our voices in praise. Let us worship God. us that no one is without sin. All have fallen short of God's glory. At the same time, the Bible promises us that through Christ we are forgiven. As we pray together our prayer of confession, may our hearts be prepared to accept God's forgiveness and mercy. Let us pray. God of glory, we confess that all is not well with us. We are weary from our worries and weighed down by our grief. The trivialities of life distract us, and we forget to pray or study your word. The burdens we carry are heavy, but we forget that you are with each day. 
Remind us of your constant presence. Send your spirit to renew your calling within us and relieve us from our worries. Refresh our energy and restore our souls so that we might once again offer thanks and praise in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. All who truly repent will know the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. We are rescued, delivered, and restored to the fullness of life. Accept the forgiveness that is offered and receive new life in Christ that you may be filled with peace. Amen. Perfect submission. I would like my kiddos to come up here. Are you the only ones here? I guess the Henson girls are here, but do you want to come up? Yeah? Come on up. Well, I'm not really asking you, Lillian. I'm telling you. Come here, honey. She shook her head. No, I don't think I'm going to do that today. Come on, baby. I'm going to talk about Teddy. Will you come help me talk about him? No? All right. I have them right here, actually. Oops, that's okay. Here we go. There we go. Thank you so much. Okay, so as most of you know, we got a new puppy, right? And his name is Teddy. Theodore Roosevelt, we named him. And so we call him Teddy. <laughs> but um, something that I was thinking about today is how God kind of tugs us here and tugs us there and, and helps guide us in different ways. And sometimes our hearts feel a little bit tugged whenever we might do something wrong and we, we have that guilt and, and we have to say we're sorry and there's a little tug here and there. Or if you're, um, you know, excited about something and, and you feel that excitement in your heart, sometimes I think that's a tug too because God doesn't just tug us whenever we need reminded of something. He's rejoicing with us too. But it kind of reminded me of this, Lil Eric McKenzie. Do you know what this is? Do you remember what we call this? No. It's a harness, right? And what do we do with this? Can you tell them? Put it on him. Well, who do we put this on? Let me, I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. So we put it on him when we go for a walk, right? And it, he doesn't wear it all day long. He just wears it when he's on a walk. And this one he actually outgrew. But let me show you how it works. I'm not going to put it on. <laughs> so, so we snap it like that. And this is on his back, and his head goes out here, and his rear end goes out this side. So it's kind of like right here on his body and along his back. And we clip his um, leash right here. And so whenever we're walking, it kind of helps me to direct where he's going. If I pull on this, he's going to go that way, right? If I pull on it this way, he's going to go that way. Or when he likes to run after people because he's excited. He's a puppy. He wants to meet everybody, right? He thinks everyone wants to know who he is. And so he'll tug and run, and so I have to pull him back a little bit. And this helps me do that without hurting his neck. And I, it re kind of reminded me of how God tugs us around a little bit or might remind us in our hearts that we've done something we maybe shouldn't have or, or we're really excited about something or, or maybe this opportunity is coming up and, and he's tugging on us like on our hearts and saying yeah you're ready for this go for it and so there's all kinds of different ways that God can tug on our hearts and there's other ways that God can kind of carry our hearts right and so there's also in scripture there is a verse that says come to me who are, are weary and burdened right have you remind does that does that sound familiar he says come to me and he talks about this thing called a yoke and I know that we know that a yoke is something that isn't an egg right we eat yolks and they're delicious 
But that's not what he's talking about in the Bible. He's actually talking about, have you ever seen a picture of a cow or a bull or some sort of large animal, a donkey, with a wooden thing across their back and they have buckets hanging on the sides? Do you know what I'm talking about? Kind of, right? And so that is a yoke. That was a mom move right there. (laughs) That is a yoke. And so whenever an animal has the yoke on there, it kind of helps to carry that burden, that heavy weight of what they have on them. And so the farmer or whomever doesn't have to carry it. And so this also kind of reminds me of that. So we kind of can wear a harness for God to kind of help us and guide us along our path. Or we could wear a yoke that we need to pass off to God right? That yoke, that heavy burden. There's a fly. That heavy burden that's weighing us down or worrying us, and we can hand that to God, and he'll carry that for us. So there's all sorts of different harnesses or types of ways that we can think about when we think about God, and he is our biggest helper, isn't he? Yes, there's many different ways that he helps us. Can we pray together? Yeah? All right. You don't have to pray out loud if you're not comfortable with that. You can pray in your mind. But repeat after me, gracious Father, thank you for this beautiful day, and thank you for our church family who are coming each and every week or at home. We thank you, Lord, for your friendship and for your guidance and for your love and for your mercy when you carry our yoke and you forgive us. In your name we pray, amen. Very good. Thank you so much, girls. I'm only coming because I don't have the prayer. That's very fine. <laughs> Today's reading is from Psalms 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, For in that that place, God ordained his blessing of life forevermore. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Now we'll see how much trouble. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, your words from ancient scripture come to us across the generations. They are blown on the wind and in stories, and they are inspired by the angels. We ask you to be with us as we listen for your word on this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're kind of finishing up our story about Jacob and Joseph and the brothers and we move ourselves to Genesis chapter 45 beginning with the first verse. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him and he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. And Joseph said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land for two years. 
and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. God made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks and your herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years to come of famine, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother's Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, all his brothers talked with him. Here ends the readings. 15 verses of scripture. Fifteen verses of scripture. That is what we have here this morning. If we hadn't heard any of the story of what went before it, would they make sense today? For the story of Joseph and his brothers is one of deceit and betrayal. Within its pages it speaks of famine and feast. It offers heartache and hope. But today we are left with just 15 verses plucked out of many pages and lots of stories. In thinking about this passage and this sermon for today, this question came to mind. If you were to tell the story of your life, what 15 verses would you choose? It's an interesting question to ponder, isn't it? Could you really begin to tell your story in just 15 verses? Perhaps to make it easier, which 15 verses would you choose from the past few months or so? Everybody will be thinking about that now. But it's rather a hard decision, isn't it? The 15 verses I decided to tell go something like this. On March 12th, I visited Bill Black in the hospital. On March 15th, we had a lovely worship service and pancake breakfast all inside. On March 16th, I had lunch at Eaton Park. And then later that day, all the restaurants were closed in, for an in-person dining for an indefinite period of time. And I know I did not go out to a restaurant for two months. I ate a lot of rotisserie chicken. <laughs> I also did takeout from Panera, Chili's, and the Boulevard Grill. I went for a lot of walks as the weather turned warmer. We began live streaming our worship on Sunday without a congregation in the sanctuary. I went for drives in the country, sometimes to Greensburg where I drove through Chick-fil-A. I went for even more walks as winter turned into spring, and we journeyed through Lent with drive through home communion on Monday, Thursday. We celebrated Easter in a different way and remembered that the Spirit of Christ was among us even as we worshiped apart. Now, Fred and the other bunnies came to live at my house, and they began to take me on new adventures almost every day. I read a lot of books watched old episodes of Glee and the Big Bang, and prepared for worship. Like everyone else, I did my best to come to terms with a world where we needed to wear masks when we were in public, a world where social distancing is the new catchphrase, and a world where too many people have gotten sick and so many have died. On August 9th, I visited Bill Black at his home, and I prayed for him and all of us 
and then began to prepare for worship today. That's 15 verses of my life since March 12th. I don't think it's enough, and yet, What happened before or after or even somewhere in the middle to help anyone understand how different life is? What else would I say? What happened in our lives or your lives just this past week to make us or to make you who you are this morning? What will happen tomorrow that will shape how we will become? Now, back to today's text. As we, read this pa- as we read this passage closely, what do we learn? Jesus wept when he met his brothers in the household of the Egyptian pharaoh after a long separation. He recognized his brothers' distress at this meeting because they had sold him to foreigners many years before. Now Joseph has a place of honor as a trusted advisor of the Pharaoh. He'd been offered prosperity and power. We also learn that there's been a famine in the land for two years and there is no end in sight. The text tells us that because of his faith in God, Joseph is now able to forgive his brothers for their past actions. Joseph steadfastly believes that God had used an extraordinarily difficult situation to bring him to this place and that moment in time where he could save his family from starvation. He made meaning out of what had happened in life. We heard the name of Benjamin, who is Joseph's younger brother, but we don't know exactly what role Benjamin has played in all of this. We also learn that Joseph cannot wait to be reunited with his father. He wept some more, and then he talks with his brothers. These are some of the basic facts from the text. It is up to the reader to place value on what the text actually tells us. As 21st century Christians, we come to this text from a place of three or 4,000 years of history mediating our judgment. We come to this text through a particular theological lens. We come as disciples of Christ who strive to understand how to make our way forward in this world even how to learn and seek and offer forgiveness to others. Now, what we do not learn is how much Joseph may have fretted over what his response would be, and if he saw his, when and if he saw his brothers once more. We don't know the trials and tribulations he might have endured to earn his place in Pharaoh's palace. We don't know what challenges his brothers have faced through all those years either. We don't know the hope and the wisdom that Joseph learned and shared along the way. We do learn a bit why the brothers were so distressed, even beyond their actions, to throw Joseph in a pit. Now, to learn more about the story, we would have to include Genesis chapters 40 through 44, but that's not our goal for the day. There isn't simply enough time. I will leave it up to you to read more, to hear about the story of Joseph and his brothers, and see what questions they may raise for you for this 21st century. I mean, I have questions that I was raised, and we talked about them at Brown Bag and Bible. They're questions about good and evil. I mentioned them last week. But how we live with the consequences of our actions, and what the process of forgiveness might be like. People say, well, that's not easy. Well, I don't think much of life is easy, but, you know, if we don't forgive, then something is stuck inside of us, wearing us down and hurting our own hearts. I mean, we discussed, and we'll continue to discuss, how do we determine what is good and what is evil? How do we decide how to address either of these things? 
We talked about the book last week, The Banality of Good and Evil by David Blumenthal, and he reminds us that both acts of good and evil are commonplace, or as he puts it, banal. Human sin is universal, and human kindness is universal too. We are all accountable before one another and for God and to God for the actions that we choose. It is up to us as human beings to begin to name what is good and what is evil. How do we discern? We continue to ask ourselves as human beings as the world changes, what is good and what is evil? What is helpful and what is harmful? How do we go forward as a community of faith as a larger community, a city, a town, a state, a nation, a world. How do we go on and discern that God is in our midst and which way we are to go? No easy answers will come forward probably, and yet that is what we are called to do as people and as Christians. Sometimes we're called to be courageous and stand up for something that is right or wrong, None of it's easy. Life is complicated. Life is complex. In this morning's text, Joseph does not reflect on the evil that had been done to him. I think he probably had plenty of time over the years to mull that over and over again. Probably at first being angry and thinking about revenge and then realizing life goes on. And if you don't forgive, you can never have new relationships. I mean, this doesn't mean that he let his brothers off the hook. You can forgive without forgetting. He never simply excused their actions. However, because enough time had passed, because he learned to respond in a different way with goodness, and maybe because he wanted to see his father again, Joseph offered to save them all from starvation. And yet he did not invite his brothers to simply move into his house. He found a place that was separate. The forgiveness was complex. We might wonder how the brothers thought about it all the way through it. Was there any residual anger now because their brother little brother was successful? Were they ashamed because they had to rely on his mercy to live again? Or maybe they too saw God at work in the midst of the larger story. Perhaps they were just glad that they were going to have a chance to survive a famine. The text doesn't give us answers to these questions. Perhaps these are the questions we have to ask ourselves as we stand under the grace and mercy of God. Do we see God at work in the midst of the larger story? Not just what happened to you yesterday or today, but as the years gone by. Are we grateful to live anew today no matter what our trials or triumphs may be? Can we always believe that there is more to the story? The universe is so much bigger than any one of us or all of us together. And so, as the day goes on, another 15 verses will unfold in all our lives. And then another, and another, and another. There is always more to the story if we are ready to believe and live into it. Are we ready to believe that God is working in the midst of all our stories, even in this pandemic time? Even when we receive news that a good friend may not live, or someone is ill or unrest meets our eyes? Can we believe that God is working in the midst of all of it? How does our belief in God's larger story of life and love play out each day? And just because God is in the midst doesn't mean God's moving us around like chess pieces. You're going to die today. You're going on a trip. 
That's not how it works. We have free will. And some people get mad about that. I had a friend this week say, oh, that's just a cop-out. I'm like, well, that's our theological basis for understanding how we live and make choices in our life. Um, we get to choose every day the good or the evil. I mean, how does our Christian faith support us as we move ahead, as we continue to remember to respect others, to love our enemies, and to forgive and forgive and forgive? But never necessarily to forget. In the midst of my 15 verses, there were many other events and people who intertwined with me along the way. And a new set of verses unfolded. Throughout the weeks and months since March 12th, I've kept in touch with friends across the country. People have been unsettled, and the protocols changed in different places as the weeks went by. Babies were born, and people died. We laughed and we wept at the events in our lives. We prepared for worship again, Danielle and Hutch and Kristen and Kevin and I, and we wondered how this might end. The farmer's market began to meet as the weather turned from spring to summer, and people were flowers or tomatoes. They discovered delicious baked goods and chatted with friends for a while. We laughed and we cried. Some people were angry at how much had changed, and yet, I wonder what does the anger do and where does it go? After two months or so, I began to venture out a bit more when things opened up a little bit, visiting Barnes and Noble with a mask on to buy another book or two. And we worshiped again in a different way in the parking lot or the garth, and God was in our midst even there and here. And we missed, we all missed what had been. And yet, we still collected food to share with each other, and some people sewed masks and lots and lots of masks. I went for more walks and read many books and continued to pray for myself and others, and like everybody else, waited to see where the road would lead. And then, on August 16th, we worshiped and remembered Joseph and his brothers. We sang and we prayed and said thank you to God for bringing us here on this day. I won quite 15 verses, but there's always room for more. So today, what verses will you choose to share? What will you select to help you be prepared to go where life leads as the days unfold? Because now summer will turn to fall with new challenges and new blessings, all waiting with us to behold the glory of life on he earth here and to watch God's creation change into a different beauty because that's where we are because God has called us here for this moment in time and our stories intertwine once more. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, it is because of your amazing grace that we have all of this. that we can see your beauty in our world. We can see your hope in the eyes of one another. We can be restored because of food and nourishment and sleep and camaraderie and worship. And we can give you thanks for all of it. And we can give you thanks that tomorrow we get to tell a new story. And it's all because of you and the blessing of Jesus Christ in our lives. For these things we say thank you and amen. Thank you and amen.
Thank you all. It's nice to look up at the clouds while that was being sung and the Holy Spirit rolling around. Come to a time of prayer and everybody has someone in your life that needs extra prayers today and so hold them up as we bow our heads together. <clears throat> Holy God, we seek you in this time of worship as we lift our voices in song and prayer. Remind us that you are always with us as we worship and even in times of great challenge or despair. Help us to know you are in the midst of our ordinary daily activities, calling us to goodness and hope. Gracious God, we know that you are present in every act of love shared between people of all ages. You are present when we share words of kindness. You are present when we stand with friends who are grieving. You're present when we're confused as to which way to go. You're always walking before us, and you are present in the midst of every step. Help us, God, to remember. Glorious God, help us remember that you are present in every story we share with our family and friends. May we choose words of compassion and memories of great joy. Help us to carry stories of the past that shape us and share them in ways that bring meaning to the lives of others. May we be reminded that you are in our stories of challenge and blessing. May we learn from our mistakes and strive to learn new pathways on this journey of life. Here in the midst of this family of faith, there are untold stories and songs just waiting to be sung. Surround us with your creative power to find beauty in each day and to remember that our first and last gift is the gift of life. Help us to honor this gift as we pray for those who care for us in our weakness. Help us to honor this gift as we pray for those who walk with us to build us up in courage and strength. Now with all our stories and your creation around us, may we share the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, praying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand if you are able.
that's a lot of love all over the place. This morning, as we have been, we have two sets of young people with baskets. If you have um, offering that you would like to leave, and we'll make sure it gets to, well, I keep saying the money man, Bill Krupa, he's here, and I always hand it off to him so we know it goes in the right place. And now, in the beauty of this day, may we remember that the Lord blesses us and keeps us. And may we remember that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with each one of us now and forever. Amen.